Uh, Pete Caffaretta, I'm a uh, forester and hydrologist for the Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. Eric asked me to do a presentation on the uh, monitoring study group and the monitoring that we've done as part of the Board of Forestry and Fire Protection and California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection work over the last several decades. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm sorry about the technical difficulties we had, but uh, hopefully people can find and hear me well. Uh, the outline for the presentation is to give a little background information on forest practice regulation and monitoring approaches, a monitoring study group overview, then some discussion of monitoring programs we've done uh, from 93 to the present, and then talk about where our reports and information is available and what we plan in the near future, and some summary points. So that's the outline. So for an introduction, uh, California has roughly 101 million acres. About 16% is commercial timberland. Uh, uh, some 9 million acres or 9% is in public ownership, primarily for service. And about 7 million acres, uh, almost half, half, is in privately owned a little bit of state timberland, but primarily privately owned. Of that, about half is uh, industrial and about half is small, not industrial. And what I talk about this morning is uh, the California Forest Practice Rule uh, application to private and state timberlands, not the federal timberlands. The Forest Service has BMPs and their own monitoring program, and I'm not going to be talking about that. This is just state and private timberlands. The industry has been adopting forest practice rules since the Zeberg Nedgley Forest Practice Act was passed in uh, 73 and actually implemented on the ground with forest practice inspectors in 1975. And the rules changed many, many times and uh, are changed every year. The uh, Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, CAL FIRE, used to be CDF, enforces the rules and monitors the rules. So permits in, in California are mandatory. We have mandatory rules based on the uh, 73 Forest Practices Act, and it's not voluntary. A lot of the eastern states uh, in the states have voluntary BMPs. We do not. We have mandatory forest pr practice rules and uh, permits that need to be uh, obtained. Basically, we get a timber harvesting plan, uh, plan proponent, uh, Planned to us for review, we uh, eventually approve or deny it um, and issue a permit if we do approve it. Compliance, uh, we don't have to do an environmental impact report. The THP or Timber Harvesting Plan review process has been deemed a functional equivalent for CEQA. As far as the lead agency, and the plans are reviewed uh, by four state agencies. Cal Fire Department of Fish and Wildlife, Regional Water Boards, and California Geological Survey. And plans are evaluated for uh, CEQA and its practice rules and other state and federal regulations. Now I'm going to talk about monitoring, but we also, in addition to the monitoring programs, have an enforcement uh, program with our own forest practice inspectors. So we have uh, something like 50 of throughout the state, and they write uh, violations and citations if the forest practice rules are not followed and try and get corrective action where necessary. We, uh, for the last year that I have data, fiscal year 11-12, there were 4,400 inspections and 360 rule violations. And many of those were correctable and, uh, and corrections were made. Examples of things that we would have correctable violations on would be where roads are in inadequately drained, we didn't have water breaks or rolling dips uh, installed, and that would be a, a violation of the forest practice rules and corrective action would be taken. There are many different ways that we monitor on non-federal timberlands in California. We put a gold star by the uh, Board of Forestry, CAL FIRE monitoring study group approaches that I'm going to talk about. But, uh, let it be known that the forest industry is doing a lot of in-stream monitoring for sediment, turbidity, water temperature, aquatic habitat parameters, fisheries. The regional water quality control boards are mandated uh, to do monitoring. They they require monitoring uh, as part of their general discharge requirements, national waivers, and TMDLs, and also, of course, watershed groups, NGOs are doing water quality monitoring, as are university and consultants. 
So I'm just about one component of what's being done on, on non-federal timber lands. I'm of the monitoring study group. It's been around since uh, 1989 and uh, formed in response to U.S. EPA's request for an ongoing assessment of the Forest Practice Rules and Forest Practice Act to make sure that uh, it's passed by the board is effective in protecting water quality. And that will lead to certification of the rules as BMPs under Section 208 of the Clean Water Act. Actually, get certification from the state water board but uh, we still have not received certification from U.S. EPA. First tenors, the monitoring study group was an ad hoc committee, uh, meetings closed to the public. The board actually thought that we needed a more transparent process that would be more visible and, and involve the public. So it became an uh, advisory committee to the board, and we now publicly notice the meetings and have it totally open to the public since July of 99. Representatives from state and federal agencies, the timber industry, and the public, and we try and meet every three to four months throughout the state, usually in Willits or Redding or down in the Central Valley. The mandate of the monitoring study group is to provide information on implementation and effectiveness of the forest practice rules that relate to water quality and riparian habitat, and provide timely information to be used by managers, public agencies uh, related to uh, improving water quality. We provide guidance. Uh, the Monarch Study Group provides guidance and oversight to CAL FIRE in implementing uh, the long-term monitoring program. And since 1999, has served as an open public forum for sharing monitoring-related information. It's by a board of forestry member or the board's executive officer, which is currently the case, George Gentry, and it's staffed by Cal Fire, which has been me for the last 20 years. More meetings are indoor meetings, uh, and we actually have no uh, NID members, which is kind of odd. It's uh, always been open to the entity uh, to decide who would attend the monitoring study group, so it's always been kind of a list fluid group. Uh, with 25 organizations invited to attend, a really large email list, but the meetings only get about 20 participants. And the last couple of years, we've been doing them on as well as webinars. Uh, form subcommittees when needed for specific tasks. We've had over 70 meetings since 94, with the minutes since 2002 available online. And I said most of the meetings indoors. We've had a few outdoor meetings. We had one in Mendocino County to look at crossings, another on Swanton Pacific Ranch in the Santa Cruz Mountains to look at the Little Creek Watershed Study, one of our cooperative projects. We had uh, with Carolyn Hensiker uh, to look at the Kings River Experimental Watershed Study in Fresno in 2007, and another one to look at post-fire uh, monitoring after the Angora Fire in the Lake Tahoe Basin in 2008. We had a strategic plan that was uh, by the uh, Board of Forestry in 2007, Cover providing guidance on developing and uh, doing progress testing, implementation, and effectiveness of the rules related to water quality, providing advice to the uh, board and a board appointed uh, research committee, disseminating the information in a timely manner, and using the uh, results and training programs. Guidance for our information is obviously the board itself and the various agencies, uh, universities. Uh, environmental groups and timber companies and the public. With that introductory material, I'm going to move into what we've actually done for our monitoring programs, and it really falls into two types of monitoring: hill slope monitoring, where we make quality estimates of rural implementation, and then quantitative measurements of erosion voids on hill slopes and riparian canopy. And then stream monitoring, much more quantitative, where we're making water column measurements for things like suspended sediment concentration, turbidity, and water temperature. And we, we think both of these complement each other very well. Instream monitoring is expensive, and we can't do it everywhere, so we have fewer sites for in-stream monitoring, but uh, they do complement each other. Monitoring offers a close linkage to the impacts from uh, a current timber operation and can test uh, the effectiveness and implementation of a given practice and provides a quick feedback loop. Thing for in-stream monitoring is it can look at long-term trends, uh, but usually not specific, particularly for sediment, not specific to timber operations and often can tie in-stream measurements to a given logging practice. So do have their uh, pros and cons. 
we've had five different uh, projects over the last 20 years that we've used uh, for ups for hill slope monitoring. Uh, we had a monitoring project, 93 to 95, to test and develop monitoring protocols. I'm not going to talk that at all. Then we had a slope monitoring program, modified completion report, interagency mission monitoring program, and 4-prime, and I'll give you real brief summaries of each of these. Health monitoring program was the first one, uh, ran from 96 through uh, 2002. It was analyzed uh, for the first uh, for six years, 96 through 2001, and that's what we reported on. Uh, it was collected on 350 plans, 345 were timber harvesting plans, and five NDMP, or non-industrial timber management plans. We evaluated rural implementation and short-term effectiveness on 191 rural requirements related to water quality. For the monitoring, about 60% of the plans randomly selected were in the Coast Forest Practice District, 26% in the Northern Forest Practice District, and 13% in the Southern District. We did the data with contractors, highly qualified contractors acting as third-party auditors. Rob Poff, shown on the right, is uh, was the one who collected most of the data and was the lead staff for this. He was a retired or is a retired uh, zone scientist from the U.S. Forest Service and did a, a nice job for us collecting this data. And having randomly located timber harvesting plans, we also had randomly located locations within plans, uh, and this was at various within a plan that we thought was the greatest risk to water quality, and that included two 1,000-foot road segments randomly located, two 500-foot uh, skid trail segments if it was tractor logged, foot uh, repair and buffer stripper wilt segments and two landings, land, random landings and two water crossings. So collectively, over six years, you can see this amount to a fair amount of data. Term report prepared for the board in 99 and a final report in 2002. <clears throat> when you look at rule implementation overall, the rule implementation, successful implementation of the rules was high at 94% shown on the far right. It was actually the highest of all for uh, wheel pizzas or riparian buffer strips at 98% and lowest for watercourse crossings and over 90% for road skid trails and landings. It pairs quite favorably to what uh, other uh, states have reported that have mandatory forest practice rules. They've all pretty much been in the same uh, general area. Uh, the average for the western U.S. states is 92%. We, were, we came in at about 94%. We looked at the forest practice rules with the poorest implementation and uh, added 20 rule requirements we felt needed improvement. 30 of those related to crossings, uh, related to roads, skills, landings, and cross, uh, will physics had just one or two each. This actually adds up to more than 20 because some of the rule requirements related to multiple categories. A little more detail on roads. Uh, for the 568 road segments, random road segments, almost half had some minor rilling on the surface. The border had some gullying. Uh, about 4% had mass failures or landslides, and 12% had cut bank or side slope sloughing. And other the sediment actually made it down into water courses. Uh, about almost 40% of the mass wasting features delivered to stream channels. A quarter of the gullies delivered. And 13% of the rills actually delivered to uh, stream channels, 6% of the sloughing. Overall, if you took all the features together, 15% of the erosion features delivered down the stream channels. And almost always where the forest practice rule implemented had judged, been judged to have been uh, inadequate. Look at the road drainage structures on forest roads, uh, water bars, rolling dips, cross drains uh, with culverts and so forth. Overall, about 5% had some type of problem, and 95% did not. Of course, crossings in a little more detail, 491 random crossings. Uh, a little more than two-thirds were culverted crossings. The remainder were fords, bridges, and then crossings, and so forth. 5% uh, of the uh, crossings eva evaluated, all the rules evaluated were properly implemented. 35% uh, had some minor departures, but not much of an impact on quality. 20% had one or more uh, rules that were judged to have a major departure from the rule requirement. So just briefly summarizing Hill 
flood monitoring, again, the implementation, successful implementation was high for all the rules, averaging 94%. Individual practices required by the rules were generally effective in uh, preventing hillslope erosion when they were properly implemented, and conversely, erosion features were almost always associated with improperly implemented rules. Didn't have a lot of uh, problems with skid trails and landings, and most of our problems were on roads and at crossings. To our next uh, program that we implemented from 2001 to 2004, our Modified Completion Report Program. Again, a random sample of completed THPs. Uh, sample size was 12.5% of all completed THPs. And in this, we used our own forest practice inspectors that had been trained to collect the monitoring data. The data plans, 281 random plans, as shown in this slide, uh, roughly similar to what we saw earlier. 50% in the coast region and 48% in the interior part of the state. We had a look at skid trails and landings since our earlier work showed they weren't a big problem area, but we concentrated on roads with a 1,000 foot uh, road segment, uh, watercourse and lake protection zones with a random 200 foot segment measuring canopy and erosion features in the Wilpas, and two random watercourse crossings. Just a quick example of what what these look like is the clay bread uh, evaluating a watercourse crossing. Clay headed up this project. And here I'm evaluating a road segment in the central Sierra Nevada and measuring canopy in a wilt is. So that's the kind of sites we were looking at. I don't have to go into all the data, but uh, for total canopy measured with the siding tube for class one fish bearing watercourses, uh, canopy was total canopy was very high in the coast at 84% and about 70% in the hotter and drier interior part of the state. In terms of uh, roads, uh, 244 road segments, actually 130 evaluated for effectiveness after at least one overwintering period, and evaluated over 1,100 road-related features for effectiveness on those random segments. About 10% of the road features were found to have some type of erosion, and of that 10%, 8% uh, delivered down to the stream channel. So a little less uh, delivery than we saw with the earlier hill slope monitoring that was at 15%. And much higher chance of delivering sediment to the stream channel if there was uh, a rule departure. In this case, the blue bars in this uh, histogram you can see are much higher. Uh, if there was a rule departure, something like a 10 times higher chance of sediment delivery if the rule was judged to be improperly implemented. Crossings, 357 crossings rated for implementation. 64% <clears throat> were judged to have uh, proper rule implementation for all the rules related to crossings. 19% had some marginally acceptable ratings, and 17% had at least one, not more rules, uh, with a major departure from the rule requirement. The conclusion from this monitoring was that uh, the rate of compliance with the rules designed to protect water quality and habitat was generally high. Post canopy, as we've seen, was high in the coast and adequate in the inland regions. Rules associated with roads are effective in preventing erosion, sediment, sediment transport when they're properly implemented. The problem with the roads was uh, finding rules that had in, uh, related inadequate road drainage, such as uh, water break spacing and decision to cover. And water course crossing implementation and effectiveness ratings were similar to the earlier hill slope monitoring program, showing substantial amounts of plugging, diversion potential, and scour at the output. Some results from the two programs, hill slope monitoring and modified completion report, about, again, 5% of the road drainage structures had uh, problems, 8 to 15 percent of the road erosion features delivered down in the stream channels, usually when the rules were properly, improperly implemented. And significantly, about 20 percent of the crossings had, had significant implementation or effectiveness problems. And we, we really learned a lot that we need to do a better job at crossings. When you combine it with some other work that's been done in California, uh, uh, we better know that old legacy roads uh, built before the modern forest practice rules were implemented in 75 have been a major source of sediment. We know for TMDL work uh, primarily on the North Coast with sediment budgets that roads produce at least two-thirds of the management-related sediment in forested watersheds. 
Usually a small part of the road network is the uh, main problem area. We have a few bad acting road reaches that really need to be fixed first, and uh, we need to locate those and uh, do the corrective work. And then surface road, <coughs> excuse me, surface road segments located within a short distance of streams that are connected with an inboard ditch uh, present the greatest risk for uh, fine sediment delivery. With that, on to our emergency mitigation monitoring project, or IMMP, a uh, pilot project that ran from 2005 to 2007. Of a social science experiment, uh, instead of contractors or forest practice inspectors, we used a multi-agency team. All the review agencies uh, got together and uh, worked on this project together, forming teams so that we'd have greater public confidence in the monitoring results. Uh, we did not look at venom sites as we had earlier. We looked at high-risk sites since there had been some criticism that the random selection wasn't producing enough high-risk sites. And the teams uh, were formed to reach common understandings and agreement and promote information sharing. The, the pipe project, the goal was to develop reputable protocols for uh, evaluating the effectiveness of practices. We chose to look at watercourse crossings and road segments draining to crossings since our earlier work with the health monitoring and modified completion report monitoring had shown those areas to be uh, big problem areas. So this diagram from Keller and Shear illustrates where we looked at crossings, the red arrows illustrating the uh, road approaches down to the critical dip, and we also looked at the crossing itself. Teams, we had a coast team, uh, and here we have representatives from California Geologic Survey, CAL FIRE, North Coast Regional Water Board, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And then we had an inland team, same agencies, and the long stress shown in the middle got a gold star because he participated in both teams. The action process, again, these were high-risk, non-random crossings based on the type of construction, how they're designed, the benefits of the water presence, such as anadromous uh, salmonids, and the physical factors, such as highly erodible uh, soils and landslide prone areas. Plans were visited in 2006 and 2007. A couple of the plans were associated with conversions to vineyards. 54 crossings were evaluated by the two teams, and basically performance-based effectiveness evaluations were performed. It was a very comprehensive set of questions, 270 questions, so it took at least an hour to evaluate a crossing. That's why so few were done. Plans that were looked at, uh, 13 in the coastal part of the state and nine in the interior part of the state. About four of the crossings looked at were courts, 25% fords, 15% bridges, and 11% crossings. Actual crossings that were evaluated, the culvert on the top left, the bush rail car bridge on the bottom left, the ford crossing on the top right, and the temporary, what we call spitler crossing on the bottom right. We looked at sediment uh, delivered down into the water courses at these crossings and uh, road approaches down to the crossings. The most common uh, area was delivering between 1 and 10 cubic yards of sediment. Uh, the next most common was a trace amount, and higher amounts uh, were, were less frequent. So just quick on findings, the teams found that virtually all crossings and or road approaches were delivering some sediment to the water course, even when the rules were properly applied. Proper insulation or maintenance of the crossings and drainage structures near crossings and in, in proper crossing removal were the main uh, cause of sediment. That road approaches near crossings produce a high percentage of the sediment uh, delivery. It leads me to what we're currently doing, and we have uh, two things the forest practice rules implementation and effectiveness monitoring, or four prime, and our cooperative in stream monitoring projects. And just quickly say a few words about 4 Prime. It's been gone since 2008. It's very similar to our earlier modified completion report monitoring I spoke about earlier, using our inspectors again to collect the data. Ramp, well, in this case, of 10% of the THPs, and uh, have a random road segment, in this case, 660 feet. One WILP is random segment, 200 feet, and two watercourse crossings. 
We've collected data on 121 THPs to date and 22 non-industrial timber management plans, or NTOs, and we're writing a summary report this winter. Brando has been heading up this project, uh, and Clay is shown here with the yellow hat. And we did uh, 11 training sessions for our forest practice inspectors as part of our QA, QC to make sure that we collected data in a sufficient manner. Uh, just coming plans that are shown on, on uh, this map of the state. We actually have more uh, strict riparian rules for uh, areas with an adjuvant, listed in adjuvant soil monitor or ASP rules. And in this case, you can see that about two thirds of the plants are in areas with the ASP rules, and about one third are in areas without the ASP rules. The base that the data is being entered into I has looked at some of the data so far. Uh, one of the more interesting things is the uh, canopy data, the total canopy data with the siding tube, shows increasing trend at 82% compared to the hill slope monitoring at 73 and the modified completion report at 78. So it's not surprising. I don't think that it's going up with more strict rules uh, requiring less harvesting in the uh, riparian buffer strips. But we have done a little bit of an uh, data analysis for non-industrial timber management plans, or NTMPs. Uh, they are long-term harvest plans that small landowners submit with a time permit, uh, so you don't have to keep resubmitting for a timber harvesting plan. Require light touch forestry, no clear cutting, and the rules must be followed. Uh, and uh, a uh, empty area typically is so like the one shown here, in this case 190 acres. Landowner typically doesn't log the entire thing. They uh, submit a one page uh, notice of timber operations for a smaller area. Uh, notice of timber operations in this case was 30 acres, and that's the part that we actually evaluated for four prime monitoring. Again, we looked at uh, total key with the siding tube, we looked at load segments. And we looked at watercourse crossings. This one, you can see significant scour at the outlet. So we evaluated uh, four, uh, and we evaluated 19 uh, at the end of 2011 uh, in the North Coast region. And 65% were in Mendocino County with smaller percentages in Humboldt and Sonoma. Uh, 19 random road segments, 31 cross and 16 Wilpes segments. Total canopy was very high at 92%. About 10 of the road lengths had some surface erosion, and 20% of the crossings had, had significant effectiveness problems. Those, those totals are very similar to what we had for uh, TPs from the modified completion report. So it doesn't appear that NTMPs are significantly different than what we found for THPs. Moving on to our in-stream monitoring projects, we have four that we consider in this category our long-running Casper Creek project uh, uh, with the PSW, Judd Creek with Sierra Pacific Industries, Little Creek with Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and South Fork Wages Creek with Campbell Timberland Management. We are located as shown in this uh, graphic, Judd Creek in eastern Tehama County, Little Creek in, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and Casper Creek in Wages Creek in western Mendocino County. First with Casper Creek, uh, it's our long-running project, uh, 50 years of data, started in 1962, and the PSW has been a, an excellent uh, cooperator for, for that entire time. Uh, it's our only long-term, long, long-term long forested watershed study in California. We have a 100-year agreement to continue uh, work to at least 1999. A lot of published papers, theses, and dissertations all available online. Two main experiments to date, the South Fork uh, 62 to 85, uh, and North Fork from 85 to the present. And I ran this project in the 1980s. Asper Creek weirs look like this. They were built in 62, very large cement structures. You can see the North Fork weir under varying uh, flotations. And this illustrates uh, the entire Casper Creek watershed at about 5,300 acres. Uh, the North Fork weir, North Fork to the weir is about 1,200 acres, and the South Fork is about 1,050 acres. The South Fork was logged. Let's see if I can. South Fork was logged from 71 to 73, and the North Fork was logged from 89 to January 2002. Uh, was the tree watershed in the first experiment was a typical paired watershed study. The 
North Fork was held as a control. And the first thing I did after a calibration period in the South Fork was uh, the road uh, up the South Fork drainage in 67. It's before the modern forest practice rules, and it was very crudely uh, built. I had tractors operating directly in the street channel, and no riparian buffer strip or will fizz was left. At least three quarters of the road was directly impacting the stream channel. And they were uh, measuring the impact of the road. In 71 to 73, they uh, tractor logged the entire watershed. Uh, we handed tractor logging, uh, landings built in, in inadequate locations, roads and skid trails inadequately drained. This all before the modern rules. And, and uh, the, uh, about 50% of the watershed was compacted in roads, skid trails, and landings. We did not cut it. Uh, it was a selective cut, taking off about 65% of the stand volume. Results up till 1990, uh, the road construction produced about twice the expected amount of suspended sediment. The logging produced four to five times the expected amount of suspended sediment, and most of the uh, erosion was uh, to relate to landslides, related to roads, skid trails, and landings. Ray Ross was the principal investigator for the South Fork experiment and produced the graphic in his publication from 79, showing deviations in sediment yield for the calibration period, the roaded period, and the logging period. Then, uh, after the South Fork had settled down, we uh, went in and, and did the second experiment in the North Fork. Uh, where we did uh, cable clear cutting. 80% of the logging was done with uh, cable yarders, and uh, clear cutting was done. This is, illustrates one of the units that was clear cut. It was half cable yarded when this was taken in July of 91. And eventually we clear cut about 50% of the North Fork over some years. Uh, for controls, we used sub basins within the North Fork, unlogged controls. This arrow illustrates sub watershed hen, that was one of our three controls. One very large erosion event that occurred uh, a short time after logging was done. Uh, in January of 95, we had a large landslide in one of the log units uh, that produced 4,700 cubic yards of sediment that went almost directly down into the North Fork Weir. So quick sediment results, the median increase in suspended sediment load was about 100% for the tributaries. At the North Fork Weir, uh, sediment increased. 89% for the first four years, mainly related to that January 95 landslide. Uh, even with the North Fork landslide that I just showed the picture of, the South Fork selective logging without the modern forest practice rules produced between about two and a half to almost three times, or almost four times more sediment than the cable uh, clear cutting in the North Fork. And its sediment increases in the North Fork were mostly related to, or most strongly related to storm flow volumes. Erosion, Dr. Leslie Reed has been looking at this, has published uh, in 2010 uh, with several other authors on in-channel erosion. Casper Creek turns out to be a fairly significant sediment source. This would be gullying, channel incision, head channel migration, bank erosion, the main sediment source when we don't have large landslides. Something like this in the soft sandstone and shale. Uh, we have nick points that migrate uh, head and uh, so the spank erosion, as I said, is, is a big sediment source. Physical results. Uh, uh, the South Fork, after roading, uh, Department of Fish and Den, Department of Fish and Game, uh, documented, saw monitored, a decrease from the roading, but it bounced back to uh, pre disturbance levels within a couple of years. Uh, at the North Fork logging, the clear cutting, there was no dramatic change, even though there was high variability. There was there was no dramatic change in the abundance of coho and steelhead. The Alan Knight at UC Davis looked at macroinvertebrate communities in the North Fork and found that uh, that logging in the North Fork hadn't uh, really significantly impacted the macroinvertebrate communities either. So, uh, Rod Nakamoto's graph from 1998 of the young of the year coho, or excuse me, young of the year steelhead in the North Fork, and pre logging, logging, and post logging, you can see. The wide variability there. Department of Wildlife is uh, doing downstream uh, monitoring of juvenile steelhead and coho every year in, in the Methema Casper Creek below the weirs, and that relates to the uh, state and federal listing of coho and recovery for that species. Uh, Gallagher of Department of Fish and Wildlife and others published this 
grant last year illustrating a life cycle changes uh, in, in coho survival in Casper Creek. And you can see that the numbers in the last five, six, seven years have been uh, really low. But uh, Mr. Gallagher attributes that large to marine survival, i.e. Uh, ocean conditions is what's really driving the coho salmon populations. And winter habitat, particularly large wood and streams, appears to be the limiting factor for these coho salmon. Last then I did put together a summary document uh, a couple of months ago uh, summarizing what we've learned in Casper Creek over the first 50 years and also has some implications for management and that document is available online if anybody would like to look at it. We've used Casper Creek data in a number of ways. We use them for uh, TDL documents in western Mendocino County including the Gia River and the Noyo River uh, TMDLs. We've used it for watershed analysis work and you know Redwood Company habitat aquatic habitat conservation plan. Caric is mostly on Jackson Demonstration State Forest and it was certainly used for the management plan for Jackson State Forest and it's also the data has been used for a lot of vineyard conversion projects such as Matt O'Connor have used uh, the Casper Creek data to look at changes in stream flow and uh, lows. Uh, for vineyard kitchen projects such as this one in Napa County. There are other cooperative projects, Judd Creek uh, with Sierra Pacific Industries in Tehama County, uh, Dr. Cajun James and Dr. Lee McDonald from Colorado State University have been uh, working on this for uh, quite a while. There was an approved plan uh, that was uh, implemented in 2007, extensive road work was done in 2009. They clear cut 16% of the watershed, uh, 34 units with 20 acre clear cuts. Annual suspended sediment yields are available from 2001 to 2012. Lee agent did not see uh, really any signal from the roading work or the uh, clear logging. Most of the variation in sediment yields, annual sediment yields, relates to how much precipitation happened in a given uh, one year. G field trip to Judd Creek uh, last year. June, uh, or not last June, but June of 2012, and uh, Lee and Cajun explained both the hill slope and in-stream monitoring that they're doing in, in Judd Creek. The third project, Little Creek, was Dr. Brian Dietrich, uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo on, on Swanton, to the ranch in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Little Creek is about a 1,900-acre basin and four engaging stations within the basin in adversity. This was unexpected. The 2009 Lockheed fire uh, burned almost all the Little Creek watershed. Over 90% of it was burned, and that changed the experiment quite a bit. They, uh, Brian uh, and his students have seven years of baseline data prior to a light NTMP type harvest in 2008, and they had one overhearing period with the timber harvest data, which showed almost no change in sediment yields. And as I said, 90% of the basin burned, mostly on ridges, not so much down, down near the stream channels. After the first winter, uh, uh, Gold documented for his master's thesis that there was still not significant changes in water quality, even with the burn, which seemed pretty amazing to me. Fourth project is South Fork Wages Creek with Campbell Timberland Management. In western Mendocino County, you can see the graphic on the right illustrating where Wages Creek is uh, related to Fort Bragg just north of Fort Bragg. So they've only collected background data in Wages Creek. Uh, we have not implemented the timber harvesting plan to do project monitoring, monitoring on yet. Our reports are available online on our MSG website, and we also have uh, fully supported reports. The MSG website with the 12 reports looks like this, and the supported uh, report it looks like this. We've done financial or given financial assistance to a number of monitoring projects in California. Chris Knopps uh, looking at uh, indices of cold water fish habitat, Tom Lyle's V-Star, Sam Flanagan's work on crossings, Marianne May and Peggy Wilsbeck work on indicators of stream health and so forth. So a lot of supported reports are on this as well. Casper Creek has its own site off of the PSW website. There's a bunch of data available and even real time data is available for stream flow and turbidity and other parameters, rainfall. So, fairly high tech uh, data available and a lot of past data for Casper Creek. We've disseminated the monitoring uh, information with conference uh, presentations.
Patton's uh, journal and comp papers, newsletters, and training workshops. Particularly, we've uh, addressed to foresters, registered professional foresters, to do a better job of processing since about 2005. We've had numerous uh, works for both uh, private RPF shown here and for AC folks uh, shown here in the Santa Cruz Mountains to try and educate folks on how to design uh, and construct better watercourse crossings. Our uh in 2013 uh, are to expand our effectiveness monitoring. We've done a lot with implementation monitoring and short-term effectiveness. We want to do a better job on effectiveness monitoring. Drew Co who works for the Central Valley Water Board, uh, wrote a report illustrating the importance of effectiveness monitoring and adaptive management for protection and restoration of aquatic resources. We've talked about beef our effectiveness monitoring and monitoring study group meetings for over two years basically showed that we really didn't have a consistently effective feedback loop uh, between the data we've collected and decision making and tried to uh, look at the process that Washington has with their timber fish wildlife uh, group and try and emulate some of their success we have developed the concept of forming uh, effectiveness monitoring committee and uh, that would we believe a lot of rules to be looked at in terms of effectiveness much more uh, in a much better way and provide an active feedback loop to policymakers and allow for adaptive management. The uh, adaptive management cycle is where you have a policy, you implement it on the ground, monitor uh, the feedback, and then modify the, uh, modify the policy. We have a letter for the newly forming effectiveness monitoring committee. It was approved by the State Board of Forestry in their August meeting in Ventura. It calls for appointed members and members that are applied scientists with a vice chair and chair appointed by the board and agency reps acting as technical specialists. We expect them to come from AB 1492. The lumber tax uh, uh, was passed January 1 of this year. We expect uh, sufficient funding to come from that avenue, as well as possibly state and private sources and grants. Good data collection to come from four different, uh, in four ways, with state agency teams, like we talked about earlier for the uh, interagency mitigation monitoring program. We're looking at water quality, aquatic habitat, and in case also wildlife habitats. Looking at uh, existing landowner programs, if they've had sufficient agency oversight and also using existing state agency monitoring programs such as SWAMP and uh, FORAM that I talked about. And then bring contractors to address uh, special issues. We fully expect this to uh, occur this year yet. Uh, we, we hope to have our first meeting before Christmas. And the issue itself will continue to function primarily as an information sharing venue. In summary, over 50 years we've learned quite a bit I think we've learned the individual practices required by the rules are generally effective in preventing hill slope erosion when they're implemented. We know forest road drainage and proper watercourse crossing design, construction, and maintenance are areas of concern and need 